Hey everybody, it's Nick Weiss, the lead pastor of the Fervent Church, and I want to thank you for tuning in to today's message, where we hope you're challenged, encouraged, and strengthened in your walk with Jesus today. If you have any questions about following Jesus or what the Bible means, please send your emails to connect at fervent.church, and we would love to answer those questions for you. Now, for more information about our ministry, visit us online at fervent.church, and remember, it's all so that people may know Jesus. Well, welcome. Happy Sunday, everybody. Um, I'm not Nick. If you guys are visiting, I'm not the head pastor. Nick is actually in Tucson uh, at a pastor's conference, so he's back in our old stomping grounds uh, down there. I think the first thing he said he was going to do was get a breakfast burrito um, and get some coffee down at this place that was really good, kind of downtown area. So we thought we would bring our own breakfast burritos here because I was a little jealous that he has breakfast. You guys don't really have burritos here. It's everything's breakfast tacos. Like breakfast tacos is a thing. Back home, it's like burritos is like you can get like a good breakfast burrito or even like a lunch burrito. It's huge and it's like four bucks. And here it's like you get one taco for four dollars and you need four of them to just be like somewhat satisfied. So we got some breakfast burritos for you guys there. Um, actually, side note, that's nothing to do with what I was talking about. I tried to order one. Uh, like one of those little gas station things. They're like, no, we don't make burritos. Are you kidding me? I was like, is that a weird thing, I guess? I don't know. Anyways, so he's out in Tucson. That's where he's at. Um, so I'm out here this week and uh, next week and really excited to kind of dive into what we have this week and next week um, because really these next two teachings are pretty much just strictly the gospel. Um, we are going through the book of John and I encourage you if you have not um, listened to or, or heard or been through these last few books, or the last few weeks, rather, uh, I encourage you to go back and listen or read it because um, we all love Netflix, I'm sure. You like shows or, or whatever. It's one of those things like if you're watching a show and you dive in to the middle of a series, like you may start to pick up what's going on, but you miss a lot of context. And one thing when it comes to reading the Bible is context is key. It is very easy to sometimes take things out of context, and that's one thing that we want to be very careful to not do. Um, but again, it just kind of setting the stage of, uh, again, Jesus's life on earth, and we're currently in the book of John. So I encourage you, you can go on our podcast and do that, uh, our website, YouTube, Facebook, you can watch those there. Uh, a couple of quick announcements. <coughs> uh, men's fishing trip. Do we have the slide for that, by the way? Um men's fishing trip. Okay, great. I've been in kids every week, so I haven't gotten this slide yet. Luke, can you take a picture of that so I can sign up? I haven't signed up yet, and I, I would like to go. My phone's back there. Um, but see, we have men's fishing trip. Uh, so ladies, I'm sorry. It's men's fishing trip. Uh, but it is a lot of fun. We're really excited. Uh, this year, again, we're going to go to uh, the Rockport area. I encourage you guys to sign up. We did have some people get sick the last time. Uh, again, I won't mention names. Uh, some of them are here. Some of them may be in Tucson. I don't know. Uh, but we had some people get sick, and, but it was a great time. This time we want to make it a little bit more um, like mellow. It was kind of like rushed a little bit last time. So we want to make this a little bit more mellow, a little bit more like time to hang out um, and fellowship, but also catch some cool fish, hopefully, and uh, bring home some food. But anyway, so you can sign up on there. Uh, click the link on there. Also, uh, small groups are getting ready to come back into full swing. If you're visiting or you haven't been here a part of small groups, we do small groups in like semesters. We're about to start our next swing of small groups. Uh, it is not, it's, it's starting in March. I don't have the date off the top of my head, but tune in, it's gonna be soon. Uh, so it's starting in like the next few weeks. And we meet at Nick and Amber's house and it rotates. So guys week will be one week. And then ladies, the next week, it's just really nice, like intimate time to one, get into the word, but also just fellowship. Uh, one of the big things that we were designed for as believers is to fellowship. And I feel like it's really easy. I know I came from a very large church before this, and you could slip in and slip out and no one would know you were there. Uh, you could run into someone throughout Tucson and be like, oh, what church you go to? Oh, Calvary, I go there too, which was cool. But also at the same time, like you're missing out on fellowship and fellowship is so important because you have people to do life with 
in a godly way. And that is something that is super important. Just as you go through, the Bible says, as my iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. It's good for just accountability, but also growth. Well, I don't want to go too much on that, but I encourage you, if you haven't been involved, to get involved. If it's a little out of your comfort zone, if you're like the person that's like, yes, Sam, I like to be the person that slips in and out and no one notices me. You don't grow in your comfort zone. So I want to challenge you to grow. So if you were like, oh, I don't know if I should do it. Uh, well, I'm not saying that you should now, but I've, I'm saying you probably should now. But anyways, uh, so that's going to be starting soon. Uh, we'll give you some dates <coughs> and details on that. Uh, once we get that, there is no bigs this week or next week. Bigs is our older group uh, for kids ministry. So with that being said, I will try to keep it brief. Uh, so I know that we may have you know kids coming through or out and all that stuff. So I'm going to try to keep the teachings a little bit more brief. Um, I think that's it for announcements. Lou, am I missing anything? No? If not, you can find it on our website, I'm sure. But okay, with that said, let's get into our teaching today. Let's pray one more time. And uh, we're going to get into the word. So again, dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you again for today. Lord, we just thank you um, just for your goodness, your faithfulness. And Lord, I just dedicate this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so we are going to be in John, John chapter 3. We're going from uh, 1 through 15. Verse 15 is our, our goal for today. And one thing I just want to mention really quick is kind of recap a little bit, just to kind of set the stage for what we've kind of been seeing. So Last week, uh, we went through chapter 2, where Jesus came into the temple. Anyone remember that? Mm-hmm. Yep, a lot of people, uh, yeah, a couple of us, yeah. Uh, and Jesus went to the temple, and what happens? He sees that it is being defiled and disgraced, and he very, I, I, again, he, he makes a scene, but it was something that was not just a reaction of anger in the sense of no thought behind it. It was a very calculated thing in what he was doing. Uh, it says that he went and he made a whip and he was flipping over tables. But needless to say that he came in and like cleaned house. He came in and was like, we cannot leave this how we found it. Like, this is not okay. <coughs> and he does, he goes in and cleans house. So one of the things that we did see though, is that there were uh, Jewish people and they asked him, by what authority are you doing this? That was the big thing. They're like, okay, why are you doing this? What authority? And how does Jesus respond? He responds by telling him, destroy this temple, and I will raise it again in three days. And now us looking big picture, we're like, he's talking about him. Like, that's so easy, right? But again, thinking about this, like, again, these are all people, you know what I'm saying? Like, these are all people, and I feel, and we're going to talk more about this later, they respond in a very, like, human mindset of, like, it took 46 years to build this, and you said you're going to build it in three days? Like, you're crazy. You're absolutely nuts. And so it was responding with the human mind of, okay, well, that's not possible. And so they said, you know, it took 46 years. Um, they totally missed the point of he was talking about himself. In fact, even the disciples didn't realize it until he was resurrected. It says that he then remem they remembered what Jesus said. And so that's a key thing is that when it comes to the spirit realm, spirit world, a lot of times we can only understand what we can understand. And it takes Jesus revealing it to us to finally make it click. Because, again, on all factors, he's like, man, like the temple. I bet you the disciples were even kind of like, yeah, this is a big temple, Jesus. Like three days, really? Like, all right, okay, well, that's kind of crazy. But it wasn't until it all finally clicked when Jesus fulfilled what he was supposed to do that it was like, oh, okay, now that makes sense. Again, something that only God can do. We also saw that Jesus was over there for Passover, that the Passover festival during that time that he was healing people, it says that many believed in his name. Now, when we get into today, uh, our teaching, it's going to be talking about Nicodemus. And Nic Nicodemus has a conversation with Jesus. I saw, um, it says that he came at night. And I, I was listening to Ed Taylor, if you know who that is. And uh, who's our millennials in here? A couple, couple millennials. Nobody wants to raise their hand. Everyone's like, don't talk about the millennials. I might be older than the millennials. Okay, anyways. Uh, bad, bad example. Uh, well, there was this thing when I was a kid. It was called Nick at Night. Do you guys remember that? Nick at Night? Yeah. Anyways, I saw a pastor, he titled his sermon, or he wanted to title it Nick at Night. And I was like, oh my gosh. First of all, it's a blast in the past. But secondly, like, that's so true. Like, Nicodemus came at night, Nick at Night. Anyways, I thought it was worth mentioning because I thought it was really funny. I can tell you guys all agree. So, <laughs> anyways, okay. So, what's setting the stage is, is this Pharisee comes, he talks to Jesus, and they have this conversation. What I want to do is I want to read through it in its entirety first. 
And then I kind of want to dive through and start looking at this. So uh, we're going to be picking it up in chapter 3, verse 1. <coughs> Excuse me. It says, Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jew Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher uh, who has come from God, and no one could perform the signs that you are doing. Hold on, I'm going to grab some water. It's allergy season, and I am dying. Is anybody else? Yeah, okay. It says, he came uh, at, to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher and has, who has come from God. No one can perform the signs that you are doing if God were not with him. <clears throat> Jesus replied, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born again when they are old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb and be born. Uh, Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to the Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, You must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and you do not understand these things. Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know, and we testify of what we have seen. But you, but still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who has come from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. Okay, so again, recapping, Jesus talking to Nicodemus. Let's dive in a little bit more, but now that you've kind of heard the conversation, let's kind of dissect this a little bit. So who was Nicodemus, first of all? It tells us right in the beginning. It says that Nicodemus was a Pharisee. Now, a Pharisee is a religious leader, and... Uh, if you guys have read through the gospel, you can see that religious leaders in that time, specifically the Pharisees, were not painted in the best light. Uh, reading a little bit of how they were described, Matthew 6, 5 says this, <clears throat> And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. This is describing the Pharisees, that they were those people that like to be adorned and show how holy they are in the sense of like, look at me, I'm making this loud prayer. Um, has anyone ever been to like family dinner and someone's prayer just doesn't stop? Like, have you guys ever seen Meet the Parents? And he's like, oh, Lord, we thank you most gracefully. We see you more clearly. Anyways, that is like the Pharisees. Like they are literally coming out and they are like, okay, how can I just sound so fluffy? How can I just make this like all about me? And that is what Matthew is saying is like they're coming. They're inherent. They've already got the reward. The reward is like other people looking at how holy they are. And that's what he's saying. Like this is a description of the Pharisees. Also, Mark 12. Let's go there real quick. 38 through 40. It says this. As he taught, Jesus said, watch out for the teachers of the law. They like to walk around in flowing robes, be greeted with respect in the marketplaces, and have the most important seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at the banquets. They devour the widow's house for a show and make lengthy prayers. These men will be punished most severely. Okay, again, these Pharisee people, again, in, in general, they are all about themselves. They're all about the show. Um, in this culture, their religion was a really big deal. And these leaders, these teachers of the law, the Pharisees, were ones that held a lot of power within the temple. I mean, they were the, the teachers. And so they kind of used that, and they kind of made that as a, of a status symbol of like, man, well, I'm so holy, you need to listen to me. And so that's kind of setting the stage of the type of group that Jesus is talking to. He is speaking with a Pharisee. Now, it says that Nicodemus was a Pharisee, a man named, uh, or, sorry, he was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. So he's not just a Pharisee. He has a seat on what's called the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin is like, in that day and age, like the Supreme Court. So not only is he like a religious leader, but he is like one of the leaders of the leaders. So this guy coming to Jesus at night is like a big deal in their religion. He's like, oh, by all means, by an earthly standpoint, it's like, man, 
Nicodemus is going there? Like, man, he's on the Sanhedrin. Like, that's a big deal. Like, that's what people would think. And so we see him come, and it says this. It says, he came to Jesus at night. Now, one of the things I want to talk about <coughs> is I do think that that is relevant. It says that he came, remember, Nick at night. Nicodemus comes at night. Uh, thinking back to what just took place uh, is Jesus went to the temple, and he did make a scene. Even though it was calculated by all other means, people flipping tables, that's something that's going to stand out to you. Like, what the heck? The dude's got a whip? Like, what the heck is going on? So Jesus came and made a scene, and they're like, by what authority are you doing this? And then he starts doing all these signs. So I think, one, Nicodemus was genuinely curious about who Jesus was. Like, who is this guy? What is going on? Like, he's not a Pharisee. He's not on the Sanhedrin. Who is this guy? But then we see him come in, make this big scene, right? And he comes to him at night. And I think, I think he came at night because, one, it drew less attention than coming during the day. He still came to Jesus, but he came at night. Most people weren't moving around a bunch at night. And he comes to him at night. The other reason, and, and some other people would say too, is that he wanted to talk to him interrupted. I kind of feel like it was more he wanted to talk to Jesus without really being associated with going to talk to Jesus. Like, okay, I'm going to go at night. Coast is clear. All right, let's go. Lights are flickering a little bit. All right, I can make my way over there. I, I think that either way, John thinks it's important enough to note that he came to him at night. He didn't just say Nicodemus came to Jesus. No, he came to him at night. And again, just thinking about this, Jesus now talking to this high ruling, high ranking religious leader. So he says, this is Nicodemus talking. He says, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with them. So Nicodemus, religious leader, right? Big deal. Calls Jesus rabbi. What that means is like teacher and even says again, teacher. And so what he's doing is he's almost putting Jesus like on the same level as him. Like, hey, uh, Nicodemus of the Sanhedrin here, I'm calling you teacher. That's kind of a big deal. And so here is Nicodemus coming in, calling him rabbi, calling him teacher. He says, we know that you are a teacher. Now, who is we? I think it is the Sanhedrin. I think he's talking about the other re religious leaders. And the reason why is, one, what Jesus did at the temple, it's not like people aren't talking about it. Like if someone were to do that, and like, think about this. If someone were to start flipping over tables over here, it wouldn't be like, okay, it's just another Sunday, whatever. All right, and uh, if you turn to the next chapter, it'd be like, oh my gosh, hey, remember last week that dude was tipping over tables? Like, it would be something people would talk about. And so I think this generated a lot of thought, a lot of questions, a lot of like, what is going on? But then this guy goes in and starts doing like miracles and doing all these crazy things. And so I think there was like a, what is going on a little bit? And so I think Nicodemus is the one who kind of takes it on himself, whether it was he was sent by the Sanhedrin or because of their discussion, he wanted to go and ask more questions. I don't know, but it was enough to where he felt like he needed to go to the source and be like, let's talk to this guy. Let's see what's going on. He says, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, <coughs> for no one could perform the signs um, you are doing if God were not with them. And then we see Jesus reply in verse three. It says, Jesus replied, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Now, one thing that I think is very interesting is he doesn't acknowledge Nicodemus's acknowledgement of him. It wasn't like he was like, oh, yes, I am a teacher. Uh, no, he goes straight into a statement. And Nicodemus, if you look and you pay attention, he has not asked a question yet. He was still kind of introing of like, hey, uh, we recognize that you're a teacher. We recognize that you're from God because you've done some crazy things. He hasn't asked anything. Jesus comes with an answer already. And what does he say? He says, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Now, if you think about that, and in the, the form of conversation, that seems a little random. But again, this is Jesus. We look back a couple verses ago in chapter two, it says in verse 23, uh, while he was in Jerusalem, uh, the Passover festival, many people saw the signs he was performing and believed in his name, but Jesus would not entrust himself for he knew all people and he did not need any testimony about mankind because he knew what was in each person. Again, Jesus knows our heart. Jesus knows what's inside of us. And I think this is Jesus proving that to Nicodemus. I think Nicodemus had some questions. Again, this is a teacher of the law. 
This is someone who would know the law very well. This is someone who would know God's word very well. And I still think he probably had some questions. And Jesus comes with answers before it's even asked. And the reason why, we'll get to that here in a second, why I believe that at least. He says, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Again, he has not asked a question. He, Nicodemus started with a statement, almost a little bit of flattery, like, hey, Jesus, you're a teacher. You must be from God because you're doing good things. And all of a sudden, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they're born again. Like, that would be like, whoa, that's so random. But look at Nicodemus' response. It doesn't respond with almost like, what are you talking about? He responds with, how can someone be born when they are old? And so almost like, okay, this dude, was he like, it wasn't like, what are you talking about, Jesus? Like, it was an immediate question to Jesus' statement. Again, this is showing that I think that Jesus knew something was in Nicodemus to where he had some questions, and Jesus, knowing what's in us, started this conversation. He says, how can someone be born again when they are old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb uh, to be born. Now, I think this response was a little bit snarky on Nicodemus's part. Because think about this. Again, Nicodemus, he's very well educated. He's a leader. He says, how can someone be born again when they are old? And think about that. When Jesus says someone needs to be born again, and you think about it rationally, you're like, well, that doesn't really make sense. How could someone be born again? But I think the way that he asked is almost like a way of like, I got you. That doesn't make any sense, right? And it was almost like a sarcastic question. I think that Nicodemus was being a little bit sarcastic in this. He says, surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. So Jesus goes into again, and he says that in verse 5, Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and of the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to the Spirit. And so now we have Jesus expanding on what he's saying. He says, born of water and the spirit. What I think that this means is it parallels with verse six. It says, talk about flesh gives birth to flesh and the spirit gives birth to the spirit. Meaning, one, when you think about this, when you are born, when you are conceived, what are you in? You're in water. You're in your mother's womb, has water. It's talking about you are conceived and then you're uh, also being born of the spirit. Now, what we're going to talk about and you're going to see here in a little bit, you can only be born in the spirit in one way. And that's what Jesus is going to go into a little bit more detail on here in a second. But he's giving him the rationale of like, your thinking is all wrong. Again, just like with the temple, when he says, you tear the temple down, in three days I will rebuild it, Nicodemus is automatically going back to earthly-minded things. You said reborn, but how can I be reborn? How can an old person be reborn? That doesn't make any sense. And the thing is, is the things of the spirit world a lot of time don't make sense to us. We can only understand and comprehend so much that without the Holy Spirit, without that, that additional help from Jesus, it just doesn't always click. It doesn't make sense. So Jesus explains. He says, uh, they are born of water and of the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to the Spirit, meaning that you need the Spirit. He says, you should not be surprised at me saying you must be born again. Um, Let me pause there for a second. We've talked about this now a couple of times. When he says born again, what born again actually means in Greek, when you look at it translated, means born from above. So born from above. So think about this. When we're saying born again, born again, it means born from above. And it's talking about the spirit. Something that we have zero control over in the spirit world. I don't know what's going on. The physical world, you know, you can only control so much even. Like now we're talking about elements that we, first of all, have a hard time wrapping our mind around and not even to understand, he's saying that the spirit can only be born from the spirit. He says, you should not be surprised by saying you should be born again. So thinking about it this way, born from above, Charles Spurgeon, he says this, a man may cast away many vices, forsake many lusts in which he indulged and conquer evil habits, but no man in the world can make himself to be born of God. Though he should struggle never so much, he could never accomplish what is beyond his power. And mark you, if he could make himself to be born again, still he would not enter heaven because there is another point in the condition which he would have violated. Unless a man is born of the spirit, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So we are talking about now something that one, only God can do. Only God can make someone born again of the spirit. And Jesus is going to talk more about that again. 
He's saying that you must be born above, you must be born from the Spirit. This is what Jesus is saying is the only way to heaven. This is what he's saying. You cannot enter the kingdom of God unless you've been born of the Spirit. Now, this would be shocking to Nicodemus because to this point, people thought they were all good. Like, yeah, they're going to heaven. They're Jewish. They keep the commandments. You know, they do all the things they're supposed to do. I'm good. I'm covered. And now Jesus is saying, first of all, he's the fulfillment of prophecy. And he's saying the way to the Father is to be born again. And he's going to talk about further what that means to be born again. But he's saying, like, this is the way. And this is something that, one, we think about, you know, 2,000, however many years later, like, oh, yeah, duh, Christian 101, like, you go to church one time, like, that's what you hear, like, you need Jesus in your heart. This is something that would have been very foreign to Nicodemus because, for one, he probably thought he was already good. He's like, what are you talking about? Like, I'm, I'm a righteous man. Like, I'm a good guy. I'm on the Sanhedrin, for goodness sake. Like, I'm a good guy. I'm, on, I'm a big deal. But if we look at the big picture, John 14, verse 6 says this. Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That means there is one way to the Father, and that is Jesus. That is Jesus. And Jesus is coming here, setting the stage. He already prophesied it in the temple. Built, Tell this temple down, I will rebuild in, in three days, talking about the death and resurrection. And then he's here coming in to his people, and he's talking to Nicodemus like, listen, the way to the kingdom of heaven there is one way, and it is to be born again. Again, this ideology that one Nicodemus is, you can tell, is wrestling with because of his response here in a second. But two, it's challenging everything that they had known to be true or thought they knew to be true. And so we're going to look at this a little bit deeper here in a second. <coughs> um, Jesus does illustrate this concept. He says in verse 8, The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Now, he illustrates this with the wind. Uh, and thinking about this, like their understanding of the wind. Like even us, like I, I know people smarter than me can tell like, oh, the winds come because, you know, this pressure and this pressure. I don't, I don't know. But thinking about this, putting the, the cookies on the bottom shelf for a second. I know the wind blows. I can feel the wind. I can see the wind move the trees. I can sometimes hear the wind when it's super loud. But I don't know where it's coming from. The only way I know is I throw some grass in the air, and I'm like, okay, that's where it's blowing. Okay, great. I kind of feel it on this cheek, but I don't know. And he's saying the same is true of the Spirit. When you have Jesus in your heart, it is going to start to have effects on your life. Just like the wind has on the trees or whatever, it's going to be changed. It's going to be doing something where maybe someone looking at it is like, I don't know what it is. I don't know what's going on. You know, if people were to not know, let's just think about this for a second. If you had a, and you're going to have to really use your imagination. This is probably not the best example. If you had no idea what wind was and you just saw a picture of a tree in a windstorm, you'd be like, that tree is like dancing. Like, what's going on with the tree? Is, the tree, is that a thing trees do? No, it's the wind. The wind is causing that. This invisible force is causing this change. And we know some windstorms, they can be crazy too, right? They can uplift things. And it's like something that you can't see can be so powerful. And it's like, that is what he's saying is the same as with the spirit. Like you may not be able to see it. You may not even understand everything of it, but it doesn't mean that it's not powerful and that it's not strong. That's what Jesus is trying to articulate. Like you may not understand everything. You may not know or really recognize everything, but it doesn't mean that it's not true. And it doesn't mean it's not going to have a big change. That's what he's trying to illustrate to Nicodemus. He responds in, in here, and I think this is Nicodemus genuinely trying to understand this. He says, how can this be, Nicodemus asked. <coughs> Verse 10, Jesus replies to Nicodemus saying, you are Israel's teacher. Jesus said, and you do not understand these things. Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony I have spoken, it, uh, uh, spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak to you of heavenly things? No one has gone into heaven except the one who has come from heaven, the Son of Man. Now, excuse me. Now, um, again, Jesus' response to Nicodemus is one, I think, Nicodemus at this point is genuinely like, how can this be? Like, trying to understand. I don't think this is him no, any longer being snarky. Um, and Jesus, I think at this point, is starting to flip some tables in Nicodemus's heart. Because again, we talked about who Nicodemus is. 
and enough to where John felt worth mentioning that he was a Pharisee and on the ruling council. So he's on the Sanhedrin. So again, Nicodemus is kind of a big deal in that day and age, at least in man standards. And he's saying like, that's not, that's not it. And now he comes and he says, listen, you are Israel's teacher and, uh, and you do not understand these things. I think this is almost like, listen, you're like the best of the best and you don't get it. Like, meaning you aren't capable. Like you are our best. And that's the thing. And that's what Charles Spurgeon was saying too. Even at our best, we are nothing. We are nothing. That we are nothing without Jesus. And he is saying, uh, <coughs> you are Israel's teacher and you do not understand these things. Very truly, I tell you what we speak of and what we know. If you look back to how Nicodemus started, He's, again, Jewish religious leader on the Sanhedrin. He starts by saying, Rabbi, we know. He starts talking about what we know, what man knows, what the the Sanhedrin knows. And he says, you're Israel's teacher and you don't understand. Meaning you guys that think you have it all together, you're missing it. And how does he respond? He says, we speak of what we know. Now, this is Jesus saying what he knows. Again, Jesus being omniscient, all-knowing, saying what he knows. He says, uh, and we testify to see what we have seen, and you do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you with earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe it if I speak of heavenly things? Now, I will say this. I'm not going to harp on Nicodemus too much because, again, 20,000 feet view, 2,000 year glance at everything. It's like, Nicodemus, dude, you're talking to the Messiah. Everybody knows that. Like, come on, that's the guy. That's the guy you've been waiting for. It's really easy for us to look back and do something called Monday chair quarterback. Look at it after it's done and be like, look at the mistakes he made. I feel like people do it all the time when we look at the Israelites, uh, which I'll talk about a little bit more next week. People look at the Israelites like, how can they be so dumb and just keep doing these same things over and over again? Like, these are real people. Like, you think about us, I think about me, I won't even talk about you guys, talk about me personally. Like, a lot of times, like, I'm like, man, like, this doesn't make any sense. How am I going to do this? I start getting in the way of my own, my own mind, and I'm like, gosh, and then God is faithful. It says that God's faithful in our faith, in our faithlessness or faithlessness. I can't talk. Anyways, um, and so this is him saying like, <coughs> you don't have the answer. You don't understand or you're not believing. And I will say to Nicodemus's defense a little bit is even the disciples didn't understand what Jesus was saying when he was talking about the temple. And so sometimes, like I said, it does take time. It takes time for sometimes Jesus to reveal stuff to us and the Spirit to reveal stuff to us. Sometimes when we're called to do something, it may not make sense until later. It may not make sense or it may seem crazy um, until later. But the thing is, 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 and we'll talk about this a little bit more next week, is the obedience in in the belief in the faith. Um, I think about it like this, and if you guys have been around in in my Biggs class especially, we've talked about how... um, We can only understand so much. Like I talked about earlier, there's some really smart people in this world. There's some people that understand some crazy stuff. Morgan and I, my wife, we were talking about on the way over here, um, like these bridges they're building. And they're like, man, how did someone just think about like putting rebar and like concrete and this is going to support like thousands of pounds? Like who just thinks of that? Like on their own, like I'm like, okay, like I can maybe put together like a kit from Ikea with the instructions. Maybe, you know, like, you know what I mean? Like some people are just incredible. But the thing is, at the end of the day, Nicodemus being in the role he was, he was like the top of his game in the religious world. And Jesus is saying, like, you still know nothing. Think about us, like people in general. Like I I think about and compare it to this. Uh, When I was, uh, I don't know, like middle school, I had a pastor share this and I I hang on to it. It's like, has anyone ever ever had a goldfish at your house or when you're a kid? I did. His name was Rocky. I fed him tissues and pizza and he died, surprisingly. Apparently, that's not a good diet for a betta fish, but um, my point is, is, is those fish, right, they only can understand so much, right? They can understand so much. You have their little guy, their little scuba guy on the bottom. He recognizes, like, okay, this thing's not going to eat me, whatever. You put your food in the little tank. What's it do? It swims up, knows the food's there, right? But that fish has zero understanding of what you do with your day, Nothing doesn't understand who your friends are, who your family are. You may talk to your fish. Uh, kind of sad story. When I lived out here first, I lived out here. Um, we did the church plant stuff, but I had a job, and they're like, you have two weeks to be out here. So I lived out here by myself for like four months. 
And I got lonely and I bought three fish. <laughs> and I'm all, what's up, boys? How we doing? I don't even know if they're a guy fish. I don't know. I'm like, yeah, I had a good day, you know, whatever. But your fish have no idea about any of that. They can't comprehend that. They can only comprehend what they can digest. And it's like, oh, food? This thing's not going to eat me? But it has no idea about, okay, well, who's your family? Who's your friends? What do you do for a living? How's your 401k looking? It has no idea about any of this. And so the same is true of God, the creator of the universe. When we start to think of ourselves as like, man, I'm pretty awesome, pretty smart. I've got a PhD. I'm not talking personally. I don't have a, I, I'm still a, like a 12 year sophomore in college. I, I haven't finished yet. I, I'm holding out. I might go back. I don't know. Uh, but my point is, is like when we are comparing ourselves to the creator of the universe, it is like a goldfish in a bowl. Like, we have some pretty smart goldfish in this world. Don't get me wrong. There's some brilliant people. But at the end of the day, compared to the creator of the universe, I mean, I would even say that's a very generous comparison, but it, it does not compare at all. So when you talk about this, and Jesus is talking about, we can only understand so much. And I think a lot of times we get so focused on what we don't understand that we forget about what we do and what we have been promised. I can't remember who it was. I can't remember if it was a, it was one of the old old great dead guys. I don't know, Charles Burgess, somebody. It was one of those guys. They were like, I'm not worried about what I don't know about God. I trust what I do know about God for the things I don't. And like, that is sometimes where we sit. And it is, sometimes it's uncomfortable because we want to know things. I want to know like, why is this that way? Why is that that way? I'm a goldfish in a bowl. And sometimes I can only understand so much. One day, you know, when we're up in heaven, I think Nick was talking about this. I'm going to have a lot of questions for God. Like, why is this like that? Why is that like that? Why is it? Why did you do this? You know? And once we understand in a, in a greater sense of what he is doing, things may make sense. But right now, we're a goldfish in a bowl, and we can only understand so much. And this is what Jesus is like basically doing to Nicodemus. He's like flipping the tables in his heart. Again, someone who would have been very like fonded over, like, oh my gosh, Nicodemus is here. Like, they like, like I said, they like to have like the highest seats at the banquets and stuff. Like, they're a big deal. Pharisee comes over. Nicodemus comes at night. I believe because he didn't want to be associated with Jesus during the day. Like it was one of those things, like I don't want people knowing like Nicodemus went to Jesus' house or Jesus' place. Like he came at night, but he did have questions. And Jesus, again, I think knowing Nicodemus' heart speaks to him and not just speaks to him, but comes in and flips the tables in his heart. Like you're the teacher of the law and you don't understand these things. Again, that would be a big deal. Like Nicodemus' mind is probably going like, what is going on? Who is this guy? Like, what is happening? Again, a very humbling look at who we should be looking at ourselves in is we are nobody. We are nothing. Even at our best, it says that we are not good, right? Um, so continuing on, <coughs> uh, how then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has gone into heaven except the Son of Man who comes from heaven. I'm sorry, except the one who comes from heaven, the Son of Man. Verse 14. Um, verse 14 says this, just as... Uh, Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. Now, again, this is something that is, he's relating to something that Nicodemus would know, which he's talking about the snake on the pole. Um, do I have any like prior like EMS folks or doctors or nurses or anything? Okay, yeah, you know where I'm going? Okay. Cool. I'm not one of those either, but that's fine. All right. We're all, if basically if someone got hurt, we're all just at the whim of YouTube, I guess. Um, <laughs> all right. So uh, anyways, I'm going to turn over here <coughs> quickly to numbers. And, and I want to point this out because what Jesus said should resonate very much so with Nicodemus. Again, he's a teacher of the law. He knows God's word very well. And so what he is saying is something that should click in Nicodemus's mind. So let's go here. It's Numbers 21, verse 8 through 9. It says, The Lord said to Moses, Make a snake, put it up on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. So Moses made a bronze snake, put it up on a pole. Then anyone who was bitten by a snake looked at the bronze snake, and they lived. Now, <clears throat> what this was is Moses and the Israelites, they were in the desert still. This is after they left Egypt, before they went into the Promised Land. They're wandering around, and the Israelites, again, like I said, it's very easy to look back and like, they're so dumb. They made another mistake. We do this. Sometimes we forget what God did for us last week. I'll talk more about that next week. But not to beat the point is there was, uh, they were complaining about something else. Israelites were complaining. 
So Jesus, or sorry, God sent snakes and people were getting bit by these snakes and dying. So God, the Israelites, it says that they recognized that they sinned, that they were repentful. So God made a way to save them. He had a pole. He said, Moses, build this snake, put it on a pole. If someone gets bit, have them look at it and they will be saved. Like, that's it. Like, they don't have to do anything else. Like, 10 jumping jacks, climb a mountain. Like, they just have to look at the pole. That's it. And then they're saved. Okay? Now, this symbol, I was trying to get a picture of it, but if you guys have ever seen, like, the EMS symbol or the ambulance, it's a pole with a snake on it. That was coming from numbers. That is literally coming from the Bible, that symbol. First of all, how cool is that? That that's, like, around, we think of that. Like, that's our way of, like, our symbol of, like, healing. It because... That was the way that God commanded them to be healed. When they got bit by the snake, look at the pole. Like, that's it. It wasn't like they had to do some crazy quest or anything. Like, it was literally like nothing they could do other than just obedience and look to what God gave them or God had, had made for them, right? That was it. Jesus is now telling Nicodemus, like, just like when Moses was in the desert and he had the pole, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. Again, Nicodemus is a smart guy. Jesus just told him that he's smart, but he's not that smart, but he's still a smart guy. He still understands things. This is something that would have resonated with Nicodemus is like, okay, this guy is just not a normal guy. Like he's saying, basically, he just told him he's the Messiah. Like that's who he is. Like he's like, the son of man must be lifted up. Only one that's been to heaven has been the one that was, came from heaven, the son of man. And just like the snake in the desert, he must be lifted up. So again, thinking about this, tables being flipped over in, Jesus, in uh, Nicodemus's heart. Like, man, what is going on? This is crazy. All these things that I don't understand. And then he gives him the answer. He tells him, just like, uh, so the son of man must be lifted up that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. Eternal life. Now, again, big picture. We know what happens. Jesus dies on the cross for our sins. He's resurrected three days later. Like, we all know that now looking big picture. Like, we see that. We recognize that. We see all of that. But that's what he's trying to illustrate to Nicodemus. And I do think that Nicodemus did have a heart change because Nicodemus was actually one of the ones that was there at Jesus' burial um, with Joseph of Arimathea. It was Nicodemus was there to help bury Jesus. So I do think this was something that resonated with him. And I mean, just based off of, it's, it's hard to make the assumptions, but I think that Jesus got to Nicodemus that day into his heart and I think that you will see that play out. And we probably are going to see this dude in heaven like, yo, Nick at night, what's up, dude? Like, how's it going? Remember that conversation? We read about it. Yeah. Anyways, um, verse 16, I'm going to touch on this more next week. But I do want to at least talk about it. It says, for God so loved the world. You guys should all know this one. It's like on every sports poster out there. Uh, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. That is the answer. The Son of Man must be lifted up. It is Jesus that is the answer. It's the easy Sunday school thing. Like when you ask, like people ask like questions like, what's this? Oh, it's Jesus. Like, yeah, yeah it is Jesus. No, Jesus literally is the answer and he's the only answer. It says the only way. There is one way to the Father and that is Jesus. Nothing man can do. This is Nicodemus. Like, all man's standpoint, like, this dude is righteous in that sense. Like, that's what they would have thought. He's on the, on the Sanhedrin. He's like, dude, you're missing it. You're missing it. There is only one way. So I want to talk about this again. Being born again, being born from above, that is change. That is something that only God can do in us. The old is gone and the new is reborn. The act of obedience for Israel, when they got bit, was look to the pole. Our act of obedience here is look to Jesus. Just like they looked at the pole and they were healed, we need to look to Jesus. Um, when we accept him in our heart, we are reborn. And in fact, the Bible says we are a new creation. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says this. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, and the new has he is here. 1 Peter 1, 3 says this. Praise be to the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. The answer is Jesus. When we are born again, we are changed. We are changed. Um, change, by definition, cannot stay the same. It can't. 
We cannot say the same with Jesus. We surrender our life to him, but make no mistake, he will do the work in us. He will, but it does require us surrendering to him. Um, in our bigs class, I talk about this and it just kind of helps illustrate. We've been talking about like building good foundation. Um, like you build your foundation, like the parable of the rock versus the sand. You guys remember that one? The guy built his foundation on the rock, storm came, was good. Dude built it on the sand, it's gone, right? So we talked about that. We talked about that with our, our bigs class. I'm like, hey, you guys have such a blessing and such a benefit that you have Jesus now that you know Jesus now, because your building blocks, your foundation for life, if you can stay rooted in Jesus, like you are going to have a solid foundation versus, you know, someone who's been in the world, living in the world, and then coming later to him. Not that Jesus isn't going to do that. We'll talk about that in a second, but like how much stronger a foundation if you've been walking with him, like all your whole life, you know what I mean? We we talk about this, um, Chip and Joanna fans, anybody, Magnolia fans, a couple of us. I heard, I heard a silent woohoo. Like, a, a, yeah, a couple, a couple of us, okay. I went to Waco, it was okay, I don't know. I went to the bakery, it was overpriced, it was all right. <laughs> Anyways, the best thing I got there was a sweet tea. Uh, it was a big, giant, like, gallon of sweet tea thing. It was pretty cool. Anyways, we talk about Chip and Joanna. What do they do? Their show, Flip or Flop, or whatever it is. Is that their show? No. Flip or Flop? No? Which one's theirs? Fixer Upper. Fixer Upper, okay, thank you. Yeah, you didn't raise your hand when I said you like Chip or Joanna, did you? Uh, that's a fan. Oh, okay. Well, I guess that's another reason why you would know. Never mind. All right. Bad example. Uh, okay. So Chip and Joanna. Well, oh, yeah. You're in Waco, though. That's why you don't like them. Okay. That's a bias point. True. I can understand that. All right. Um, but what they do, if you aren't familiar with the show, they take a house, one that was run down, one that's, you know, in bad condition. And what do they do? They gut it. They gut it, they redo it, they make it all nice, like all new fixtures, shiplap, shiplap, whatever, you know, do their thing, all this fancy stuff, I don't know. But they make it real nice, and then they sell it for way over what they bought it for. And I'm sure the people of Waco are like, what are you doing? Our community is going up in prices, everything's going up. But the point is they come in and they make it something where it's like, man, that is, that is nice. Oh, look at that thing, oh, that pretty good. Anyways, it's like, that's what Jesus does in our heart. He comes in. He takes out all the old, he takes it up, and he builds it up, and he makes it new. Makes it new, right? And that's what we're talking about when I talk with the bigs. We're like, man, you guys building your foundation right now on Jesus, like, talk about, like, the master builder, like, coming in and just letting him shape your life. Like, now, don't get me wrong. Our life, even if we start with Jesus at a young age, it's not going to be perfect. We're going to make mistakes. We're going to have things, like, even a, a good house now, if you think about the house example, needs maintenance, right? Sometimes it's like, man, a pipe burst. Like, that's not good. Sometimes we mess up. And what I want you to understand is walking with Jesus does not mean you are perfect. We're going to talk about that in a second. It doesn't mean that you are perfect, but it does mean that you are changed. We are changed. When you let Jesus into your life, it's like the Chip and Joanna. Let them in, whether you like them or not, I guess. Let them in. Let them do the work. They're going to go. You just got to let them in and maybe pay $200,000 for Chip and Joanna. You don't got to pay that for Jesus, though. But the thing is, you let him in, they'll do the work. Jesus will do the work in your heart. He's going to make it new. He's going to make it something better than you can imagine. And it's like, that's what he will start to do in you. You just have to give him the access. And that is inviting him into your life. That's it. You can't do it on your own. Like, we're talking, again, something spiritual. Like, Jesus just spent talking to Nicodemus. Like, you cannot do it by yourself. You can't do it on your own. You need Jesus to do it. But he is going to make you something new. He will make you something new. Again, we are not perfect, but change cannot stay the same. Uh, 1 John 1, 5 through chapter 2 uh, says this. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. Here's the thing. The Bible talks about that we can deceive ourselves. that we can deceive ourselves. One thing is really easy to do is deceive others. We can deceive others very easily. I can say something and maybe make up like, yeah, I know, actually, I am a weather guy. I've been a weather guy. I mean, I probably couldn't make that one up, right? It's something else. I'd be like, yeah, I played pro baseball whenever from, uh, you know, 2005, 2007 or whatever. Yeah, it hurt my arm. You know, I could probably trick someone into thinking that. But this is talking about tricking ourselves. James talks about that we can deceive ourselves. One of the things that this is saying is this is like a gut check for us. Again, Nicodemus thought he was good. Nicodemus came into this conversation like, I'm Nicodemus the Sanhedrin. Like, I'm a big deal. And Jesus is like, dude, 
you're missing it. The Bible says we can deceive ourselves. It says if we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. That is like if you were like, yeah, Chip and Joanne are going to come fix up my house, but you are letting a bunch of people live there, party all the time, wreck it, trash things. It's like they're going to try to undo everything that's trying to happen. Like it's just not going to work. It's not going to work. You can't live both lives. If you are surrendering to him, it is letting him come in and do the work in you. It says that we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in light as he is in light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. Purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. It is saying, listen, we are all messed up. The Bible says that we all fall short. We all have sinned and all fall short of the glory of God. All of us. Like we are not free from, or we are not cured from sin in the sense of like we're not going to sin anymore until we've like left this earth. Like, we're going to still struggle with something until we're done here. Um, again, if, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins and not only ours, but the sins of the whole world. We're going to talk about that more next week. But the thing is, is when we walk in light, we no longer have fellowship with the darkness. When we have Jesus, we are reborn. We are a new creation and new cannot stay the same. So when we look inwardly, again, I'm not, I'm not saying like you guys are perfect. I'm not saying I'm perfect by no means. If you spend any amount of time, you're like, yeah, Sam, you're definitely not perfect. You got a lot you could work on. True. Probably very true. Uh, but the thing is, is we should be different. We should be changed. It should be changed. You may be like, man, I got upset at something, but you know what? I went and I apologize. I was remorseful and I'm genuinely trying to work on it. That is different than, oh, I'm just mad. I'm just going to stay mad. I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing because that's me. Like that is like, dude, you're making some scary choices. But anyways, there is no house too broken for Jesus to come in and fix. Nothing. Nothing you could have done is going to be too far for Jesus to come in and fix. We're talking like he is the master builder. He will come in and make you new. He will come in and make you new, but sometimes it is painful and sometimes it does take time to walk through things. Sometimes there is healing. Sometimes there's a lot of hurt that takes time to heal. Sometimes you may never be healed from certain hurt until you're done here. Like there are some scars that run deep, but what you can't have is forgiveness for people. We'll talk about that more on another day as well. Um, but even a solid house, I'm going I'm to close here in a second. Even a solid house, even if you've been walking with Jesus a long time, you still need maintenance, and it requires intentionally walking with him. It does. We all make mistakes. Like I said, sometimes in a house, you've got a busted pipe. Sometimes in your walk, you blow it. Sometimes you messed up. Sometimes it's a little thing. Sometimes it's a big thing. But the thing is, it says that Jesus is faithful to forgive us of all sins. All sins, right? We're going to make mistakes. What I want to end with is one, Jesus loves you more than you know. He's already defeated sin. Just like the Israelites just had to look to the snake to be saved, you just have to look to Jesus. That's it. He did all the work. He did all the labor. It's not like this crazy quest you have to do to have eternal life. It is literally just live for Jesus. Have him in your heart. That's it. Have him in your heart, and that's how you're reborn. I want to close with this. Uh, we don't have communion today. We are out of cups. Um, but I do want to close with a time of prayer. We're going to have uh, the worship team come back up here in a second and uh, lead you guys in a song. I just want to encourage you with this, is if you have something today, or if you're like, man, like, I just, I blew it this week. I had the pipe blow, uh, and I messed up this week. Don't leave today without putting that at Jesus' feet. Don't leave today without making that heart clean. Um, he is faithful and just to forgive us. And my biggest thing is if you guys need prayer for stuff, like, again, it talks about fellowship. Like, I talk about fellowship. We talk about fellowship here. Like, there is so much power in prayer. A lot of people think, like, prayer is the least you can do. Prayer is the most you can do for somebody. Is like, to be just coming before the Father and praying for someone, like, you're not in it alone. If you're having struggles or if you're having fears or doubts or you've got bad news at the doctor or whatever, like, you're not in that alone. I want to encourage you to find prayer one with somebody, maybe around you or, or in small group where you can come to prayer with me or, or whoever, but don't handle that alone because we weren't designed 
to walk in life alone. We were designed for fellowship. So I want to close in prayer, and uh, I'll invite the worship team to come back up uh, so we can just bow our heads. Um, Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I just thank you for today. Lord, I just thank you for your faithfulness, Lord. I thank you for your uh, grace and for your love, Lord, that you died for us, that you did the work, Lord, and paved the way. And Lord, we just are called to be obedient and to love and to seek after you. Father, I just pray that you forgive us right now of any sins, forgive us of anything that would be impeding us, Lord. I pray that we can just live our life for you as a light so that others may know you. And Father, we just thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen.